Here at Ananda, we view our teachings as a path. It's a path of principles and truths, each one of which is distinct, and yet uh, all are intimately interconnected. I picture it also as, as a tapestry, a magnificent tapestry, flawless in its design and in its composition, woven of divine wisdom. As we follow its threads, they show us the way to a life of, of beauty and of bliss. The thread I would like to follow this morning uh, is on this theme of, of interconnectedness because it relates to the question asked in our, in our reading today, essentially who or what is a true Christian? Is the answer limited to a specific religion? Or is it about an ideal that is greater than any religion? The answer should be obvious, but obviously not in practice. In our basic meditation class, we talk about the eight aspects of God. Peace, calmness, wisdom, power, love, joy, sound, and light. These are also, though unique, deeply interconnected as we delve into them and, and study them carefully. The eight function as one. And so it is too with the laws that govern the universe. They're like the colors of a rainbow. They emanate from a single source. We see them individually, but they operate in concert as a single orchestration. In a rainbow, we see the entire range of our visible spectrum. But in reality, only one color is present, the color of pure, invisible light refracted into the mere appearance of red, yellow, blue, green, and, and, and so on. Now let's think of this in relation to us also. Are we not also refractions of that light and all of a single source? In skin tone, size, shape, and personality, we appear to be individual and we may act in, in widely different ways, but in essence and in truth, we are one. We are made of the same stuff. Land, sea, sky, stars, the consciousness within it all is the consciousness within us. Oneness underlies all that is, and it runs through every facet of the lessons that we are here to learn. The great saint Ramana Maharshi was once asked, how should we treat others? He replied simply, there are no others. But we forget, don't we? We forget that all we are of that invisible ray, that single source. Because we appear to be separate, our oneness is understandably hard to relate to. And furthermore, most of us, I think, uh, enjoy the thought that, that we're a bit different, that we think of ourselves perhaps as, as special, as standalone colors apart from the rainbow itself. We cultivate a personality, we acquire habits and patterns of behavior, we develop desires and opinions, 
We ride on waves of emotion and often fall into moods. In short, we are trained by the lives we lead to turn our focus outward, such as our socialization and our egoic tendencies. But if, you know, if you take any two people, each with myriad likes and desires, and then you extrapolate to a planet of seven billion, all of us a swirl in a vast array of disparities, desires, and, and judgments, what you have, is the result is this crazy and often dysfunctional world that, that surrounds us. It's beyond our control. We have political parties, tribes, ethnicities, and nations embroiled in degrees of, of disagreement and, and of strife. And nowhere is this more evident than across the gamut of religious beliefs erupting sometimes uh, into acts of war. When Yogananda came to the West, his mission, in part, was to rehabilitate what a Christian is. It is he or she who embodies the principles and truths of original Christianity principles and truths that apply to every religion. Most of you, I'm sure, have heard Master's quote that Christ was crucified once, but that his teachings have been crucified daily ever since. When you get to the heart of the issue, true Christianity is simply right living. It's about the golden rule, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. Because there are no others. It's about attuning ourselves to the study and practice of those eight aspects of God's divine consciousness. Jesus put it in no uncertain terms. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. He didn't mean we would then receive fame and fortune or anything else that is mortal by design. He meant that in developing ourselves, devoting ourselves to finding and knowing God, that in that we will attain what we really crave and cannot find in any other way those eight aspects. Peace beyond the limits of even our understanding. Calmness so deep as to give us the strength and courage to stand unshaken amid the crash of breaking worlds. The wisdom of superconscious, intuitive insight. The power of self-control. Love without condition. Lasting joy that exceeds our concept of happiness the resounding experience of Om in body, mind, and soul, and the inner communion, inner communion with the light of the Lord. What in this world compares with any of that? Nothing does. And yet we allow ourselves to favor all manner and description of lesser pursuits, assuring that we will experience some form of, of disappointment or even grief at times as our dreams 
and our fleeting pleasures fade away. Master said that we begin to change when we finally tire of the anguishing monotony of falling into the traps of our worldly designs. When we turn within and seek our happiness here in the heart instead of out there. When we start to focus on giving instead of getting. When we aspire to become the true Christian that God sent Jesus to model for us. In this lifetime, we of Ananda have been blessed with another extraordinary model to observe, study, and to emulate, Swami Kriyananda. I know of no one who faced more seemingly impossible challenges, who endured more difficult physical illnesses and betrayals, and yet who rose above every obstacle and setback to accomplish astonishing successes in multiple fields of creativity and and inspiration, all the while maintaining a blessed state of inner bliss. Isn't that what we want also? I'm going to digress for a couple of minutes, uh, but with a little luck, I'll work my way back to uh, make sense of taking this detour. I am of a certain age, as they say, when memory becomes less reliable than it used to be. Uh, I can remember as a teenager when I had almost photographic retention and the ability to bring information stored in my head to to instantaneous recall. Uh, Not so today. I now depend on writing notes and lists, which works fairly well as a backup system, especially when I remember where I put them. (laughs) You know, these days in driving around town, we frequently come to signs uh, that say, road work ahead, expect delays. As I've gotten older, that's often the message that my brain encounters also when I'm trying to remember a name, a word, or where I've left my keys. Suddenly there's a flagger in the roadway of my mental activity with a sign that says, stop. And there I am, waiting for the signal to proceed while the workers up here try to repair the connection to wherever it was that my thoughts were going. Most of us view the decline of memory with with a measure of sadness. Although it appears to be a natural phenomenon, uh, we tend to view it with a sense of frustration and despair. Granted, it can be inconvenient and even embarrassing at times, But in the greater divine scheme of things, what does it really matter? Is it important for our spiritual welfare to remember the the facts and details and events of this worldly life? Truly, it is not. What we really need to remember is to stop listening to the voice inside us that causes us to lose our way back to God. True Christians, whether they are Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, followers of Christ, or any other great saint or self-realized master, true Christians are those devoted to serving God without personal motive or expectation. It's they who are thereby serving all of humanity, along with their own soul's quest for liberation. It's Swamiji again who showed us that self-forgetfulness 
is its own supreme reward. Nothing he ever did was about him. And nothing he ever accomplished or endured was able to interfere with the love and light that he expressed every day. It's tempting to excuse ourselves from the level, that level of, of consciousness to say that Swami was simply more advanced than any of us, and maybe so. But wouldn't we all like to have that inner peace and joy? Wouldn't we like to know what it means to be eternally free? Nobody gets there by shrinking from the tests, tests that come our way or by asking, what's in it for me? As master's unwavering disciple, Swamiji was ever the true Christian. He urged us to make that same commitment for only one reason, because it is the way to Satchitananda, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. Returning to our home and God is a journey of ultimate simplicity. We think of it as complicated because it requires us to be courageous and strong to let go of priorities that, that compete with our spiritual growth. We think of it as complicated because it means turning away from the pressures and conformities that bind us to society's false promises and delusions. When we're caught in that mindset, we're trying to win the unwinnable game. But let's give ourselves a little credit too. We found our way to this sacred path of self-realization. And we've got five charioteers ready to drive us to victory the moment we surrender to their guidance. We also have each other to lend support to our acts of renunciation whenever we dare to invest them with energy and faith. And we have a loving God who, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, never loses sight of his true devotee. Love, serve, and rest in God. Such is the way of the yogi, the true Christian, in every respect. It's not about religion, and it isn't hard to grasp. It's about remembering to forget the little self who thinks that he or she knows better. May God bless us all as we dare to be different, as we dare to be free. I'd like to close with a reading from Whispers from Eternity by Paramahansa Yogananda, very appropriate to this topic. It's entitled, Save Us from Religious Bigotry. O oh, our one Father, we are traveling by many true paths to thy one abode of supreme truth. Help us to understand that the diverse religions are all branches of thy one tree of truth. Bless us that we may enjoy the intuitive tested ripe and luscious fruit of self-knowledge that hang from every branch of true scriptural teachings. Thy temple is but one. In it we sing thee a combined chorus of many religions. Teach us to chant together in harmony. May the combined expressions of our love for thee make thee break thy silence and lift us up as a mother does her children, onto thy lap, 
of universal understanding and immortality. Om. Peace.